There we go. Hey guys. Hello. Hey. Howdy. We've uh, this is great. We've been having like a regular crew for the last couple of weeks. It just feels like a family now. <laughs> Although where's Nicole? She's so busy. busy and Sandy too. sends her regrets as well. So anyway, this is the weekly space hangout. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. And this week, we are going to be talking about uh, early megastars, left no remnant, a super Eddington black hole. Where did the moon's water come from? Nearby galaxies that resemble early universe and the 30-meter telescope that's, uh, that's getting going, plus a whole pile of stories from the Weekly Space Hangout crew. So stay tuned. I think this is going to be great. Joining me this week, we've got Dr. Brian Koberlein. Hello. Dr. Koberlein. We've got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. And we've got uh, Ramin Skiba. It, I, I keep forgetting. It's doctor, right? Yeah. Yes. So, all right. Well, I got I to gotta remember. I got to get all the doctors and then the, <laughs> the, the highly advanced master students all separated. Dr. Skiba. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, well, let's get cracking. So um, first, I want to thank everybody that emailed me and told me that, yes, indeed, they do watch the video version of the Week Space Hangout. I get the message loud and clear. We're going to keep it in the iTunes feed. Now, uh, for those of you who are like can't find your way to YouTube every week and you really want to be able to listen to the Weekly Space Hangout while you're running or perhaps commuting on a train or doing housework, you can download the audio edition or the video version. Both of them, you can find them wherever podcasts are distributed. So, uh, no problem. And we won't kill the video version yet. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, let's get cracking. So the first story... Uh, oh, right, a couple of things um, before we get on. Uh, one, uh, I have a cold. I apologize. You can hear it in my nose. <laughs> it's all in my head. Um, Actually, I have one too. <laughs> really? All right. Yeah. <laughs> so I will try to lean on the mute button as I go into coughing and sneezing fits. Um, but you just get to enjoy the hilarious nasal Fraser. Um, the uh, the second thing is that you can ask this question, say hi, using the Q and A app, which should be available. If you're watching this video live, you can just click that. And uh, oh, and the feature is disabled, even though I turned it on, so you can't use the Q and A app. I apologize. Sorry, I don't know why it's not working, because I guess computers are stupid, that's why. Um, so uh, you can't communicate with the Q&A app, so you can go over to the, uh, to the event page on Google+, and uh, you can ask some questions there, or just send a tweet. Uh, I'm fkane at Twitter, and hopefully I'll, I'll catch it. Um, so you can't do that, but I have enabled the Showcase app, I hope, so you should be able to see um, uh, links to the stories that we're talking about, and hopefully this will work really well. Okay, so first up, we're going to talk about the new monster telescope that's going to be breaking ground. So, Ramin, what's going on? Sure. So the 30-meter uh, telescope, or TMT, just had their uh, groundbreaking on Tuesday, uh, and it's at uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And uh, so it's so the TMT is run by researchers at the University of California, which is how I heard about it, um, as well as uh, Caltech and uh, people in uh, Canada, in, uh, China, Japan, and India. Um, it's one of a of three uh, big telescopes that will be coming up in the 2020s. Uh, the other ones, which also have inventive names, there's the European Extremely Large Telescope and the Giant Magellan Telescope. Those will both be in Chile. Yeah, so as you can see in that image, it's uh, it's much larger than uh, uh, it, well, it will be much larger than any other telescope of its kind. So uh, the Keck telescopes are 10 meters. Um, it will be more powerful than uh, the Hubble telescope, and uh, I think 10 times more powerful. Um, and then, as well as uh, more powerful than other uh, other telescopes that it would be compared to. So it's it basically will have better resolution and will be much deeper. So it will allow um, uh, allow uh, astronomers to see uh, nearby objects in greater detail, but it will also allow astronomers to see uh, uh, galaxies and quasars and things like that in the more distant universe that are not detectable by current telescopes. So can you uh, give us some comparisons? I mean, like how... I mean, it's 
it's got three times the radius yeah. of of say the uh, the Keck ten meter observatory and some of the biggest telescopes out there, but it's yeah. going to have you know obviously a much larger surface area on this mirror. How much better, how much more powerful and sensitive a telescope is this going to be? Yeah, so it's so it's actually not. I I don't th I think it's actually not a, a single mirror, uh, but a bunch of uh, a bunch of like hexagonal things connected together or something like that, which I think makes it different than the other big telescopes. It's like seven uh, Keck telescopes arrayed in a hexagon. Yeah, so it's it's pretty yeah. huge. It's um, so yeah, I I, th I think they claim that they'll get up to twelve. It'll be twelve times as powerful as the Hubble tel Hubble telescope. It's um. It's of course not being in space. That, uh, it does have to go through the atmosphere, but it is very high up in in uh, uh, Hawaii, and so it uh, uh, there won't be that much atmosphere to have to deal with in, in reducing the data. So it, it, they'll definitely. I, I don't know exactly like uh, how much further they'll be able to see, or exactly how much the resolution will go up. But and also things change a little bit between the plans and uh, what's actually executed when when the uh, uh, telescope comes online and the like 2022 or whatever, but it should be. It may be the first of those big telescopes, and so it will be. Um, definitely, there'll be a lot of uh, impressive science to come out of it. Uh, there's, there's also. I don't know if you heard, but there was also a, a little bit of controversy because there was a protest when this uh, groundbreaking occurred. Um, this sometimes happens when new telescopes come on or are are being started at. Uh, 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 in Hawaii, so it's, it's often native Hawaiians and sometimes environmentalists. Um, I think, uh, I, I guess there were legal challenges when uh, they were trying to build the telescope. Uh, the land is actually leased, uh, so the land is not owned by the University of Hawaii or whatever. It's um, So basically what happens is I think they're allowed to take down a telescope and then set up a new one so that they're not taking up much more land, but obviously this is much larger than any other telescope in the area, so it's maybe a little bit. Uh, I can understand why maybe some people might be unhappy if it, it since it will obviously dominate the uh, uh, the view and everything. But yeah. um, but I I don't know the details of, of that uh, of that case. I mean they they still were able to have the groundbreaking, and the plan is still that the telescope will be built within uh, uh, eight years, and then yeah. have first light in 2024. And there's a whole class of these telescopes, as you said. There's the Magellan, and then what were some of the other crazy names? The overwhelmingly large telescope. The <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> An extremely large telescope. Extremely large yeah, telescope. Yeah. 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 So the, the, there will be, uh, and I think they will all cover from basically UV to uh, infrared wavelengths, um, but you know, with slightly different coverage. And the advantage of this being in Hawaii and the other ones being in Chile is that um, they'll be able to. Map different parts of the universe and see, you know, uh, much have much larger catalogs of galaxies, quasars, and stars. If if they were all in the northern hemisphere, then a lot would be missed. Fantastic. Okay, cool. So let's move on. Morgan, where did the moon's water come from? Yeah, that's a good question, and it's one that we've been puzzling about for a long time now. If we step back to the 1960s, uh, when the Apollo astronauts brought back you know, hundreds of kilograms of moon rocks, uh, they were almost astonishingly dry. We analyzed them in labs back in the 60s, no traces of water whatsoever. And so that kind of set up the picture of the moon that we've used for the last 50 years or so, that it's, an ex it's basically a, one giant desert. But in the last 10 years or so, a number of orbiting spacecraft have detected uh, signatures of water uh, in the rocks on the surface. And we really didn't know how to reconcile this with the results of Apollo, which showed no water at all. Uh, but we were able to go back and reanalyze these Apollo samples. This is the advantage of a sample return mission, as you can always come back later with better instruments. So the technology today is much, much better than the technology of the 1960s. We can see much smaller amounts of substances within the rocks, and we found water. And so now we think that there is water uh, in a number of places uh, on the surface of the moon. The question then shifted from is there water to where did this water come from? Uh, and the most popular theory is that the water came from comets that struck the moon uh, and then melted and released water onto the surface. This is 
you know, one of the common theories for how the Earth got a lot of its water uh, as well. So it made sense that the moon probably got its water that way too. But it, it turns out that maybe that's not how it happened. Maybe instead the water was created on the surface of the moon one molecule at a time. And this would account for the remarkably small amounts we see. Uh, and so how would that happen? Instead of water being deposited already made in the form of a comet or something like that, this was individual oxygen atoms on the surface of the moon being pelted by hydrogen atoms from the sun. So the solar wind is a stream of charged particles that emanates from the sun in all directions at all times. And a lot of that strikes the surface of the moon because the moon doesn't have a magnetic field. And so what happens is sometimes these protons, which are moving very, very fast, hit a oxygen atom and they bind together. And we know oxygen or water is H2O. So you need two hydrogens hitting one oxygen and you get one molecule of water. And over billions of years, we could have formed enough water basically to account for what we see on the surface today. And so you might wonder, how do we know it was this and not the comets? This is, seems like a crazy explanation in comparison to a comet dropping off a bunch of water at once. That's much easier. And it comes down to what are called um, isotopes. So hydrogen, as we see it most times in the universe, is made up of one proton and one electron. But there's this other substance called deuterium. And deuterium is hydrogen with a neutron attached to it. It's a little bit heavier. And so instead of being H2O, you'd have what's called D2O, deuterium water or heavy water. And we find this on the Earth. We find it places out there in the universe. And we can tell the difference between them based on their weight. Uh, heavy water is heavier. And depending on the source of the water, you'll get a different percentage of heavy water versus regular water. So comets have one basically ratio of these. It's called D to H, the ratio of the deuterium water to hydrogen water. And water produced through processes coming from the sun produces a different ratio of D to H. And organic processes, like things that act in our bodies, they produce a different ratio of D to H. And so we can understand the origin of water we see out in the universe simply based on the ratio of this hydrogen to heavy hydrogen. And when we analyze uh, the moon rocks with our new fancy instruments, we find um, a D to H that's very different from that of all the comets that we see uh, out there today. And that's more similar to what we'd expect from something coming from the sun. So is it almost like it's raining on the moon? <laughs> it's almost like reverse you know, it's like, rain. It's right? like it's raining hydrogen and then the hydrogen is interacting with the all oxygen molecules and it's turning into water. Like, could, could future astronauts go out and... and figure out some way to collect this hydrogen that's pelting the oxygen to provide the kind of water that they may require, you know? No. Uh, the, Apollo astro the Apollo mission, the Apollo results were not terribly wrong. There is extraordinarily little water on the surface of the moon, at least in places where there's light. There is one place we think there could be a lot more water, and that's in craters on the north and south pole of the moon that are permanently in shadow. And here, water likely was delivered by comets in big chunks, and these ice blocks basically fell into the, into the craters where no light ever shines on them, so they're not warm. And that ice has lasted for hundreds of millions or even billions of years. And so it's been proposed that this is where we build our, our moon base, is we build it next to one of these uh, collections of ice in one of these craters. Uh, and because there's no light, it's also the temperature is very constant. The surface of the moon sh shifts in hundreds of degrees from day to night, and that's very difficult to deal with mechanically. Um, but in the crater, it's the same temperature all the time. You have a steady source of, of ice, of water. This would be an ideal place to send uh, early uh, moon residents. So the moon residents could go on uh, nighttime ice expeditions uh, <laughs> to bring back to their base. Yeah, that's right. I, I still think they should just like set out like a big rain barrel, fill it with oxygen, <laughs> and just wait for it to fill up. All right. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so Brian Koberlein, you you are lucky enough to be talking about what has to be the coolest image I've seen in in weeks. So uh, let's talk about this. Uh, early stars just blew up. Yeah, this this image is actually a, a based on a computer simulation of 
I guess what you could call ultra massive stars. Um, it's one of the ideas is in the very early universe when things were more dense, you you might get the formation of not just huge stars, but immensely huge stars. So tens of thousands of solar masses um, to 50, 60,000 solar masses. Yeah, say that again. And, say, say, well, sorry, I, like I hate to interrupt and, you, but say that number again. Because I literally, when I saw this press release, I just looked at it a bunch of times and went, that can't be right. Can't be 60,000 times the mass of the sun. They're talking about 60,000 times the mass of the sun. So about 10 to 60,000 times the mass of the sun. And on that scale, calling it a star is, is a little bit different. This is not like a main sequence star. Um, this would be you know, an immense uh, cloud of condensed gas and plasma that is undergoing fusion, is undergoing that type of activity, but it hasn't settled in. It's not a main sequence star that's going to last for billions of years. These things, you know, based on the computations, would last something on the order of a million or two million years. It's not very long. And that's on the order for typical stars to form is on the order to, you know, 100,000 to a million years is something like that. So, so these things are kind of collapsing, staying somewhat stable for, you know, a little bit of time, and then becoming unstable. And the reason there's interest in, in them is because they're one of the ideas in which you could have the formation of supermassive black holes in the early universe. If you had a super huge star, then it could collapse, leave a, a very massive black hole remnant, and that could be serving as a seed to galaxies and supermassive black holes. So, you know, we don't have anything, anything we have observed in the universe is actually only 100, 150, 200 solar masses, so it's nothing like this. So this research did computer simulations of these really, really massive black holes. And what's interesting about them is that because they're so big, when modeling these types of stars, you have to account for things that you wouldn't normally have to. So you would have, you know, relativistic effects over the course of the star. You have photo dissociation of the nuclei because everything is so intense that you've got, you know, so much energy being produced that nuclei are being ripped apart. So all of these things have to be modeled. And when they did this, they found something kind of interesting in that when you hit a mass of about 55 to 56,000 solar masses, the way it becomes unstable creates so much turbulence, so much instability, that it doesn't create a remnant. So basically, stars in that kind of sweet zone would you know, last for a little bit of time, million years, million two, something like that, and then as they collapse and they're unstable, they would kind of rip themselves apart and there wouldn't be any remnant. So you wouldn't have a black hole seed. You wouldn't have anything left over. And it's kind of surprising because you would think, you know, the bigger the star, the more remnant you're going to have. But in this case, it looks like not. What's, what's interesting about it is that it actually leads to another mechanism, which is how do you seed the universe with heavy elements, which is anything other than helium, hydrogen and helium. And this is one mechanism that can do it because it rips everything apart so you get all these things scattered out. It mixes really well so you have a good mix of, of all the things that are produced. And you don't have a remnant where a lot of the stuff gets stuck in a neutron star or a black hole. So it would be a, a kind of a really efficient way to enrich the early universe. Um, it is all computational, so you know we still have to take it with a little bit of grain of salt. But uh, the other thing they do is they actually point out that with new telescopes coming on the horizon, uh, particularly the um, uh, was the Euclid, the Euclid telescope could be sensitive enough to see what looks like supernovas that are really highly redshift but have a slightly different spectra. And so these stars would have a different spectra than traditional supernovae, and so you could actually see them. And when we have sensitive enough devices, that might be observable. So, so what would you get in that? I mean, I can imagine that environment. If you get that much gas <clears throat> coming together as this fifty-six thousand, but it, but more, right? Like that's just that's where mm -hmm. the the turbulence starts to kick in, and you get these things right. blowing themselves apart. Now, now I'm just trying to remember because aren't there smaller stars that'll do that as well? Aren't there a certain class of like type one? Supernova, you know, wolf ray stars that will do the same thing. Yes, that, that, that will apart. do a similar type of thing. Yeah. Um, what's surprising about this is that a star so 
large or, or a mass so large would not collapse into a black hole that you know that you wouldn't have some type of remnant that would create a black hole. But you could imagine this environment that's so packed together that these stars are detonating, and they must have all happened, you know, literally as soon as these stars could form, these yeah. things formed, and then they all blew up. <clears throat> Their material ran into each other and then made more of these things, right? Right, right. And that's, you know, it, it relates to things like finding first-generation stars. You know, when, when we look at with pop three stars, we don't see any. And we see some that are kind of pop two that are early pop two, but they're just not, they're not quite pure. And, you know, this type of thing could explain part of the reason why we don't see that. If, if they last really short and they seed really fast, then, then it would be really hard to see first-generation stars forming around still. Right, it's like the universe was just shuffling its elements really fast right in the beginning. Right, right. Yeah. So, again, it's it's still theoretical, you know. I mean, we don't know that those types of stars actually formed, but it's an interesting idea. So I just want to show you a picture here. This is back to the first story we talked about. Hugo Burnham over on the uh, event page put up... Oh, it's not going to work. Bummer. I had a picture of the Hugo. If you go to the event page, Hugo Burnham put up a, an image of all these big telescopes, and you can see what they're going to look like. I could dr explain it with words, but uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a comparison on the event page. There's a comparison of all the different telescopes: the big, overwhelmingly large, the extremely large, the, the Magellan, all of those. So, yeah. All right, let's move on. Um, next up. We're going to talk about, back to Ramin, so we're going to talk about a nearby galaxy that resembles early universe ones. Yeah, so there's uh, a, uh, a galaxy that's, you know, so by, by nearby it's like, uh, I don't know, three billion light years away. Um, so that's it depends close. On, <laughs> depends on your concept of that. <laughs> um, so there's, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm only a little bit familiar with reionization, but I'll, I'll try to uh, explain it. So it's, um, so early in the universe what you have is, um, electrons combine uh, 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 to, to form, uh, or electrons and other particles combine to form uh, hydrogen and helium, and uh, it's called, that's called recombination, even though they never combined before, but uh, it's just a historical term, and that happened uh, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Um, so that freed uh, photons to basically, uh, uh, they last scattered against those particles then, and so that's the basically where the cosmic microwave background comes from, which is uh, what was studied by the Planck telescope and other telescopes. Um, then, uh, a few hundred million years later, uh, which is still very early in the universe, um, these, uh, uh, what you have is, is um, neutral gas that, that becomes uh, ionized. And so this is a period of, of reionization. That's around a, a redshift of, that's redshift of six, uh, if, if, you, if you think in terms of redshift. Um, and what was not known is what uh, what caused this reionization. So was it stars? Was it quasars? Was it galaxies? Um, so basically, you need something that would emit uh, in, in, at very high energy wavelengths, so at, at uh, U, ultraviolet wavelengths, um, which incidentally is something that uh, the, the uh, TMT, the 30 meter telescope, will observe. So hopefully, it will shed more more light on this. Um, so there's this telescope that was observed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is based in New Mexico. Um, this galaxy uh, has the exciting name of J0921 plus 4509. And uh, it has, uh, so they've, they've observed a bunch of, uh, of hydrogen gas with, uh, basically with holes in it. And so the question is, how much radiation can get outside of the galaxy? So uh, people thought that, uh, that the fraction is very small, but you need a large fraction um, you need galaxies that have a large fraction uh, of the photons getting out in order to ionize the universe, uh, you know, at uh, at redshift six. And so, um, at least in this nearby galaxy, they were able to observe it, and they saw that uh, it had an escape fraction of something like 21 percent. So basically, what was happening is you have stars. Uh, so this is a star bursting galaxy. So it's, it's a very extremely rapid star formation. Um, it uh, blew, blow, blows out gas with, with these hot stars, and then it basically, uh, they, they're calling it a Swiss cheese galaxy. So these, these pockets allow uh, more photons to, to fly out. And so then um, if, 
if you have galaxies like that in the, in the early universe, then they could be the, uh, the explanation for reionization. So people had thought that that was possible, but they weren't sure because the galaxies hadn't been observed like that. But now that they do have an actual example of a galaxy that could do that, it's, it's now a, a more uh, plausible candidate. Uh, there's still a lot that's not known, like uh, whether it starts in low-density parts or high-density parts of the universe, or how rapidly the, the process occurs. Um, but in any case, it seems like these sorts of starbursting galaxies uh, are, a, uh, are, are a plausible explanation. Very cool. Um, I, I have no questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so well, let's move on. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, what's the next one we've got here on our list here. Uh, right, a super Eddington black hole. Yeah, so this is uh, going to be kind of a tricky one. So let's let's take it one step at a time. Well, fortunately, we've got two astrophysicists on hand, ready right, to jump in. Right, and then somehow I ended up with this story after all that. <laughs> uh, so if we look out at the universe with an X-ray telescope, we see some areas that are very bright in the X-ray. And we call these things X-ray binaries. And we think of them as being a black hole, or sometimes a neutron star, but right now we're going to pretend they're black holes, uh, with a normal star going around it, in orbit about it. And that black hole is using its gravity to steal material, gas, off the surface of the star. And as that material falls towards the black hole, it kind of gets crunched together in like a traffic jam around the edge of the black hole, and it starts to heat up. Gas starts running into each other, friction occurs, heat. And that emits a lot of light and a lot of x-rays, and that's what we see uh, with our x-ray telescopes. But once in a while, we see an x-ray binary that is really, really bright. And we call these ultra-luminous x-ray binaries. And it seems that, on average, every galaxy has, like, maybe one. Not, they're very, very rare. The Milky Way does not seem to have any ultra-luminous x-ray binaries. And the question is, how are they so bright? Because if you think about these galaxies, oh, I see we have a picture here. Uh, ah, there we go, yes. Uh, if you think about these galaxies, oh, I'm sorry, about these binaries from sort of a classical physics standpoint, there is an upper limit to how bright they can be. Because the more and more gas that the black hole steals off the star, the hotter and hotter it gets because you're cramming more and more material into that little area and it heats up. And that heat starts to push away the gas. And so now you're not adding more gas because you're too hot and you're pushing away that gas. And so you get to this point called the Eddington limit or the Eddington luminosity where basically you can't get any brighter because you're so hot you're pushing away the gas that's trying to come and to make you brighter. But we do see X-ray binaries out in the universe that are brighter than this so-called Eddington limit. And for a while there are a few ideas about how this might have happened. One idea is that these galaxies or these binaries aren't emitting their light in all directions. They're kind of like a lighthouse. And so when you're caught in the beam of the lighthouse, it looks really, really bright. But really, averaged out over the whole lighthouse, it's not as bright as you think it is. Another idea is that these were made by what are called intermediate sized black holes. And intermediate mass black holes are big enough that they can be brighter without crossing this limit, because the limit is a function of the size of the galaxy, or the black hole. Man, I can't talk today. Uh, the third idea is that somehow we can overcome this Eddington limit and emit more brightly than classically you'd expect that you could be able to do. And so what this new research showed was they found one of these ultra-luminous X-ray binaries and by measuring the speed of the star as it orbited the black hole, they could get a measure of the mass of the black hole using Kepler's laws. And they found that this is not an intermediate-sized black hole. And this is sort of the first time that we've been able to pin down accurately the mass of one of the black holes in one of these ultra-luminous X-ray binaries. Because remember, these are all you know millions or billions of light years away in other, other galaxies. And so it's very difficult to know anything specific about them. But now we know the mass of one of these, and it's less than 15 times the size of our sun. And that would put it very, com or very confidently in the stellar mass category. And so this is a very short paper. It's only about two pages. And so they don't take 
the chance to rule out this sort of lighthouse idea. But they do rule out this intermediate mass idea, which suggests that maybe it is possible somehow to overcome this Eddington limit and uh, shine more brightly than, than otherwise we'd think you'd be able to do. So I think the, the best part about this entire <coughs> press release that brought this is what they compared the amount that it's gobbling up. That it's ingesting a weight equivalent to 100 billion billion hot dogs every minute. <laughs> so that'll, so that'll I, win know, and I, I really think this is what, what all black holes should now be compared to is is hot we should emotion. know just how much material in hot terms of hot dogs the hot dog accretion rate the hot dog accretion <laughs> limit yeah yeah we need an acronym a a giga dog black hole giga yeah dog. exactly <laughs> and i guess they the were radiation pretty... levels in bananas and yeah. <laughs> yeah well it gets us away from comparing things to the size of Rhode Island right right poor Rhode Island yeah yeah so now we could say a chunk of of arctic ice of, of of has or sorry a chunk of uh, of uh, Antarctic ice has broken off from the ice shelf the equivalent to four hundred thousand hot dogs <laughs> something like that right <laughs> that, a, that, a, that an asteroid an asteroid the size of six billion hot dogs is uh, is going to make a close flyby of Earth on Thursday yeah. this is the sort of thing you get if you type uh, random quantities into Mathematica is it'll tell you similar <laughs> things of that mass. Wolf and hopefully, the Earth yeah, is, hopefully yeah, the hot dog will do this. Yeah, you could absolutely say the mass of the Earth in hot dogs and it would tell you. Or use yeah. fig newtons instead of newtons. Fig newtons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So I, I, the gist of the, um, of the press release was that it was I guess accreting matter. It was, it was consuming matter more than a black hole should, and that doesn't right. seem right. Like it's it's not like there's a fairly predictable way amount of material that a black hole can accrete and how much it can actually consume. And the and when you get more, it it piles up in this accretion disk around the black hole, right? So right. Is that right, that's the that's the puzzling aspect of this is you know why mm -hmm. are these ultra luminous binaries so much brighter than we think they should be? And this one was at least two times brighter. Uh, than it should be if it was a 15 stellar mass black hole. And mm -hmm. if it was smaller than that, then we're talking about three or four or five times brighter than it otherwise should be. And we really don't have, as far as I'm aware, a good explanation for how this happens. Right. I mean, keep in mind the Eddington limit is is not just pressure that's keeping it from collapsing. It's actually the light itself. It's the pressure of the light which is preventing it from reaching the black hole. So the Eddington limit in a star, for example, would be when the light pressure pushing out on the gas is actually preventing the outer layers of the star from collapsing. And the idea is that it can't be bigger than that because it, it would rip itself apart. And the same, you can do the same Eddington limit for black holes. Um, the one caveat is that the Eddington limit as it was originally derived assumes stability. It assumes that this is a long-term process. And so if you have a dynamic process, there are dynamic ways in which you can get over the Eddington limit. But it's it's you know it's kind of an interesting situation, right? That the like you get the accretion disk around a black hole, and the material can pile up and be at such density and temperature that it's starting to act like a star mm -hmm. around these these black holes, especially around the supermassive black holes. And then I guess right. that generates a light pressure that keeps additional material from being able to fall in, just like a regular star, right? Right, right. So the so same they, forces that work on a star that keep a that keep a star in hydrostatic equilibrium. <laughs> Are also the same kind of forces that that will keep these <coughs> accretion disks in check. Right. So maybe, as Brian was saying, maybe, maybe it's like a short-lived process or something going beyond the, the Eddington limit, if it's uh, not in equilibrium or something. Yeah. All right. Super interesting. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears, and we're going to sort of go through a bit of a uh, a lightning round of stories. These are stories that were proposed or posted to the Weekly Space Hangout crew, uh, Google Plus forum, on. Um, so uh, over the course of the week, various parts of this community will will post interesting stories that they like, and anything that slips through the cracks from what we were going to cover, we'll sort of try and, and add those to the uh, to the show. So a big thanks to uh, Nancy Graziano who uh, has been uh, pulling them together and curating them. It's it's amazing, and uh, 
And thanks to all of the members of the Space Hangout crew, it's cool to have a community that's formed around what we're doing here. And uh, and so it's it's awesome to try and sort of get them involved in the process. So I want to give a uh, just one last reminder to do a search for the weekly Space Hangout, the WSH crew, on Google+. You'll find the community, and if you're a fan of the show, then you can uh, participate with a bunch of the, the regular fans. So the first show that I... Sorry, the first uh, story that I'm going to bring up is this uh, this discovery that there's a cloud of cyanide uh, at Titan's southern pole. So planetary astronomers have discovered a cloud of poisonous hydrogen cyanide ice circling Titan's southern pole, and this suggests that Titan's south pole is a lot colder than anyone ever expected, and this came from Elad Avron on the crew. So, Morgan, are you following this, uh, this cloud of uh, cyanide ice? Don't get too close. Yeah, so it's interesting because cyanide uh, has a very low uh, vaporization point, which means it exists as a gas most places uh, in the universe, which is thankfully why there's not a lot of cyanide uh, floating around the Earth's atmosphere. But it turns out that space is just chock full of cyanide. Mm -hmm. And you've probably heard that uh, things that have cyanide in them smell like almonds. So I once had a cosmochemist take me aside and say, Morgan... The universe smells like almonds, uh, and and that's basically uh, basically the case. And so finding it in condensed sort of ice crystal form uh, on Titan is is like basically finding a thermometer there, because we know it must be at least this cold at that point, or it would be in a gas phase, and we wouldn't see it uh, with the Cassini spacecraft. And so that's a pretty neat uh, sort of in situ measurement of temperature that we'd otherwise have a lot of difficulty making. Fantastic. Um, okay, great. Uh, so, you know, why is it colder than anyone's expecting? That's still a mystery, right? Yeah, so it's becoming winter uh, on Titan, at the south pole of Titan now, uh, as it becomes summer in the northern hemisphere, at the Saturn. Uh, and this is the first time that we've seen winter on Titan, and so we're really just kind of discovering uh, a lot of how the seasons change on Titan, which is very much an Earth-like process. Uh, and, you know, you wouldn't understand the seasons on the Earth until you'd seen them a few times, and this is just our first first glimpse. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so one next thing story. About the seasons of Titan, though. <laughs> the seasons of Titan are due to the orbit, not to its inclination. Because it's right, orbiting because Saturn. It has... So as Saturn goes around the Sun, the orientation of that changes. Because it has the same orbital orientation orbital as time. Saturn itself, right? right. Um, okay, so next one. This one comes from Jim Meeker. And this is, and the title is "Bizarre Shape of Uranus's Frankenstein Moon Explained." So astronomers finally think they know why the Uranus moon Randa looks so strange. Tidal forces from Uranus have been have been churning up the moon. So, Morgan, this is again a planetary story. I will dig up a a picture while you can. Uh, yeah. This. So Miranda has some funny bulges on its surface, and it's been a puzzle. Uh, so we observed these with uh, the Voyager spacecraft as it flew by uh, Uranus back in the late 1970s. And how these could have formed was uh, was kind of a puzzle because at the temperatures we see out in the outer solar system today, ice is as hard as rock, and so it's not just going to bubble up uh, like um, like we see. So there must have been some source of heat. Uh, and what these new simulations are showing is that this heat is coming from tidal forces. Uh, Miranda is very close to ne or Uranus, a very large planet, and so just like the moon exerts tides on the Earth, uh, Uranus has in the past and continues today to exert tides on Miranda. And we're really in the last couple of decades getting a whole new picture of tides in the solar system. We see them uh, between Jupiter and its moon Io, which causes the largest and most active volcanoes in the solar system. Uh, we see them between Saturn and its planet, in, or its moon Enceladus, which causes the amazing cryovolcanism that creates the E-ring the e of Saturn. And now we think we see evidence of uh, this tidal interaction between Uranus and its moon Miranda. And so this is sort of a new form of heat that we hadn't considered for a long time that seems to be a lot of places in uh, in the solar system and that makes the solar system a much more dynamic place than than it otherwise could be. 
So are you saying that it might be helpful to send a probe to Uranus to perhaps uh, look for the kind, same kinds of uh, um, like the ice geysers that we might see on Enceladus? Yeah, I think that you know we know very little about uh, the moons of Uranus in comparison to the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, and in fact we didn't really know about you know Enceladus until Cassini got there in 2004, and so it's almost uh, unimaginable that we would go to Uranus and not make some amazing discoveries about the relationship between the moons, the rings, and the planet. Uh, when I asked Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society where she would most like to see a spacecraft sent. Uh, one of the things she wanted to see was was this, was a spacecraft sent to Uranus, partly because there's some really interesting sort of forces going on, some discoveries to be made. There have been no follow-up observations since Voyager went past it, but also because we would just all get to write all kinds of articles about with the title, Sending Probes to Uranus. That is... <laughs> that is, I think, uh, it m makes her giggle. So, uh, for that said. reason alone, we need to get... This. Maybe that's why NASA is not doing it. It's because they don't want to write <laughs> 10 years of press releases. Yeah, written the like press. That. They, they, they have to do it. We're ready. We're ready to take the brunt of the bad puns and, uh, and innuendo. Yeah, I don't We're... think humanity's ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, let's move on. Uh, so this one comes from Andrew Planet, and uh, so you can send your name to Mars on board the December 4th to 6th, 2014 test flight of the Orion of the Orion first flight, and you can earn frequent flyer miles while you're doing this. So did anybody sign up for this yet? Not yet. No, no but I'm pretty sure this test flight's not actually going to Mars. No, it's so not. Send your name to orbit, but not the whole way to Mars this no. time. Um, but yeah, you can go to um, mars.nasa.gov and you can put your name on uh, the Orion test flight. I don't know why they're saying they're going to go to... Anyway, you get 60,000 miles, Mars miles, when, <laughs> you, uh, when you sign up. It is good. good. Yeah. That's like good for a couple of flights to, uh, I don't know, to the International Space Station. Well, well of course, it's only to the moon. Yeah, that's like, yeah, exactly. Halfway, third of the way to the moon. Perfect. No, right. Fourth of the way to the moon. Well, no, because the moon is uh, 300 and, yeah, like 400,000-ish kilometers. So, yeah, fourth of the way to the moon. Okay. That's awesome. All right, so go to, yeah, so you can, the hashtag is journey to Mars. So I've had a couple of people offer to send my name to the Mars already. So <laughs> why? All right, let's move on. Uh, so this next one comes from Helga Bjorkog, and this is the uh, uh, NASA's New Star Telescope discovers a shockingly bright dead star. So astronomers have found a shockingly bright pulsar in the galaxy M82 is giving off the same mm -hmm. amount of energy as 10 million stars, and this will help astronomers understand ultraluminous X-ray sources. So <clears throat> this came out at the same time as this other story about this black hole that's feeding. Brian, did mm -hmm. you look at this one at all? Yeah, it, it's, uh, again, an ultra-luminous X-ray source, and it's kind of an interesting thing when the uh, supernova went off, you know, in the galaxy, a whole bunch of telescopes started turning in that direction, and so we got this wealth of data, and, and also longer-term data, so we got really good data over time, and they were looking at these uh, X-ray sources, and they found that there was a flicker within the data, and they narrowed it down to one particular ultraluminous source that I think was MIDI 2 X-2 or something like that. But it seemed to have a pulse, and the pulse was about 1.4 seconds, which is a pulsar rate. And so it looks like within the data that this is actually an ultraluminous pulsar, not an ultraluminous black hole. Although when I brought this up on my own blog, some people pointed out that now there are black hole mechanisms that could also produce that, so I haven't looked into that. So the, the article itself hints that it could be a pulsar, um, but I kind of want to go back and see if there's other black hole Which is a kind of neutron star, have. right? Yes, it's a kind of neutron star, and so we see them, right. typically we don't see them as that bright, and this is, this is kind of the pulse of the pulsar was kind of hidden in the uh, X-ray source. So in either case, it's going to be, you know, an odd object. 
Yes, black holes aren't known to pulse, and pulsars aren't known to shine that bright. So, something's up. <laughs> now, with, with the pulsars, I mean, shouldn't you be able to... Isn't there a correlation to sort of the, the I guess, the like the age of the pulsar, like how long ago it formed with the speed that it's rotating and the, how fast right. it's blasting out this radiation emissions? Like, don't a lot of them start out as pulsars and then slow down and become plain old neutron stars over time as they bleed off their energy from their, from their rotation and the, the energy they're pulsing out? Yeah, they can. I mean, in this case, I mean, 1.4 seconds isn't that extraordinarily fast for a pulsar. I mean, we have millisecond pulsars, which go at hundreds and hundreds of times per second. So, um, but it's, it's faster than you would see in terms of a variation of brightness for a black hole as a whole. In other words, you can get variation in brightness from black holes if they're active and then they kind of get, you know, pushed back from the light and pressure and then they become active again. But those happen over a longer time. They don't happen over the periods of seconds. All right, so move on. This would be some other mechanism. So this comes from Hugo Burnham. Uh, and the Mars Orbiter mission will be shifting its orbit a bit to make sure it's a good, healthy distance from Comet Siding Springs. It's going to get as close as 140,000 kilometers. So we're just a couple of weeks away now from... I think it's next weekend. Next weekend. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So we'll talk a lot about this, I think, probably next week uh, on the show. But this is going to be a very rare opportunity to study a comet up close with you know, an unprecedented number of uh, instruments. <laughs> And so the recently arrived, the Mars Orbiter mission, this is the one that was sent by India, which was built for the exactly the same cost as, um, as, a, as an American mission when you consider the, uh, the wage discrepancy between the United States and India. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I guess the point being that they're shifting the orbit a little bit just to keep it nice and safe. Safety is always the priority for these mm -hmm. things. Yeah. I guess what kind of mayhem would going through the tail of a comet cause to your spacecraft if it wasn't prepared for this? I mean, Stardust went through a comet, right? Stardust was designed to go through a comet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, so it only takes striking a few dust particles moving at uh, interplanetary speeds to basically destroy a spacecraft. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you, the odds of hitting anything are as low as possible. Uh, while still being in position to to make some interesting observations. All right, well, stay tuned. Yeah. We're going to get lots of good pictures of of this coming back to Earth. We hope, I guess, from the Mars Orbiter mission, from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which it's going to be interesting to get them to take it to turn it away from Mars and see if they can see that. Unfortunately, uh, Maven. Uh, well, I mean, Maven's going to be able to you know pull lots of data out of it, but it's not going to have pretty pictures because it it has no camera. Right. But we'll know way more about what comets are made of than we than we ever did before in much higher resolution. Uh, so this uh, last story comes from uh, Helga Birokog again. Uh, so a new measurement of the Milky Way has found that it's got half the dark matter that was previously estimated, and this helps solve a mystery that's been puzzling astronomers about the number of satellite galaxies that we should have. So Rumi, did you take a look at this? Yeah. So this is in my field, um, and I would say. Um, there's actually quite a bit of debate on that issue. So um, the, the missing satellites problem dates back to, um, I would say, 10 years or more, uh, where, so it's invented, it's coined by theorists, where um, if you look in, in numerical simulations, where you could say dark matter is easier to model than, than galaxies just because you have only gravity and the expansion of the universe. And so um, in these simulations, if you look at a dark matter halo that you think uh, could be one that would host a Milky Way-like galaxy, you see a bunch of uh, uh, smaller, uh, smaller substructures or subhalos, um, which they think would be akin to satellites. But the thing is you see lots and lots of those everywhere in the simulation. While if you look at the Milky Way, there are much fewer satellites. And so then they said, you know, where are these missing satellites? So that was called the missing satellites problem. Um, and But then actually more there were advances made both on the theory side and more satellites were observed and so it's it's actually not as much of a problem anymore but the 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 mass of the Milky Way's halo is not known very well and um, there's a new problem which was studied by uh, people at UC Irvine called too big to fail where um, 
the uh, uh, yeah, it's it's just it's you know it was a term at the time, and uh, they uh, uh, were saying that if you look at the velocity dispersions or masses of 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 the systems that should be associated with the Milky Way satellites, they're not consistent with what you see in the simulations. And so b basically, uh, to long story short, people think that the Milky Way's halo is somewhere on the order of near, um, I guess it would be a trillion uh, uh, solar masses, uh, uh, up to around two, two times, uh, two times, uh, okay, well, I'm not used to thinking in terms of, of uh, it's in log space, it's supposed to be uh, ten, around uh, <laughs> 10 to the 12th, uh, or two times 10 to the 12th, so yeah, that, that's two times, two, Two trillion, um, and so. Uh, Sorry about uh, that. I only think in logarithms. I, yeah. logarithms. I know that's. A, I have that problem all the time. Yeah, yeah. We always use logs. So, so basically, this is on the lower end uh, of of mm -hmm. the range that people find, and so, um, I, for, the impression that I get is that there's still a lot of debate in that community, and, uh, um, it's it might take a few years before people become right. convinced that's towards the lower or higher end of that range. I look forward to us publishing a whole series where we just keep going back and forth. <laughs> it, it could happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I guarantee it. All right, cool. Well, we're reaching the end of our hour, so why don't we wrap things up? So uh, before we go, we should uh, get on to some shameless self-promotion. So Brian Koberlein, where can we find out more? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Koberlein. You can find me on my web space, uh, BrianKoberlein.com. You can find me on Google+. Plus. Uh, you can go to my Patreon page and you know, support that, because if I don't say it, Fraser will. <laughs> um, pretty much easy to find. It's a unique name. So. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Morgan, where do we find out more? Yeah, well, right after this, I will uh, mosey on over to the uh, Google Plus Space community, uh, take the questions that we didn't get to today, which is pretty much all of them. Uh, otherwise, you can find me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg or on my website, cosmicchatter.org. Great, yeah. So just a reminder, if you have some questions, you want some answers, uh, yeah, go to the Google Plus Space community, which is different from the Weekly Space Hangout Crew community. Uh, it's one of the largest communities on Google+, Plus, like more than 100,000 people. Go ahead and ask your questions, and Morgan will uh, will answer them until he is exhausted. So that's fantastic. Ramin, where do we find out more? So I'm, I'm on Twitter at Ramin Skiba, and I blog at raminskiba.net about uh, both astrophysics uh, news and about uh, science policy issues. Uh, you can also link to my work website from there if you're interested in hearing more about uh, dark matter and galaxies and, and, and how they're distributed. Well, if you're watching this show, you absolutely are. Uh, great. And so, again, I'm F. Kane on Twitter. You can find me on Google+. Plus. Um, and good news. We just uh, published another one of our weekly, uh, sorry, one of our video explainers. So, the guide to space. We just talked about where you can find yourself in the Milky Way. And it's great because... Uh, Corey and Tanya Schmitz, which are a couple of astrophotographers out of South Africa, provided all of the videos and all of the pictures for this episode, and they, they're just unbelievable. So uh, you can find that on my uh, YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube slash Fraser Kane. So, or maybe it's Universe Today. I always forget. Anyway, do wherever you're watching this video right now, and if you are, click subscribe. That would be great. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks to all of the... The, the astronomers who, who helped us this week, thanks to everyone who participated over at the WSH crew. We really appreciate your support and enthusiasm. It really is what makes this whole thing possible. The fact that, that you guys appreciate what we're laying down is, is, makes it worth doing. So thank you so much. All right, and we'll see you all next week.